Okay, so a uh, very, very good morning to everyone. Okay, so uh, you know, welcome to the second part of the UI UX uh, workshop, right? Uh, actually, hope you guys are still surviving, right? Obito uh, 2020, right? I think by now you guys should have already uh, received feedback, right? Uh, regarding your milestone one submission and hopefully you guys can work on it for the upcoming uh, milestone two. Right, so right without further ado, let us get started. Right, so for those who uh, you know recently joined us, uh, I'm your presenter. Right, my name is Leslie. I'm currently a front end developer uh, at Envision Envision Digital. Now. Also have some uh, experience working in both the public and the private sector as well. Right. Okay, so uh, let's do a quick uh, recap, right? So last week, I think uh, we mainly focused on the user experience section. So uh, we covered topics like, uh, you know, skill, uh, like our user psychology uh, and also research uh, methodology like personas, user flow, wireframes, prototypes, etc. So Today, we'll talk more on user interface design, right? So things such as colors, layouts, icons, buttons, all the fanciful stuff that you see on uh, you know, our user interface. So this is our primary uh, focus for today. Okay, so content, uh, we will first start off with a bit of motivation about UI. Then uh, we will cover some of the visual cues like colors, fonts, etc. Then uh, we will also talk about the uh, use some of the UI components, like specifically buttons, right? Because uh, it is often regarded as the om omni uh, presence of UI elements, right? And also we will also learn how uh, our users engage their eyes when it comes to user interaction. And then we will also talk about uh, some of the difference, right, between uh, iOS and Android along the way, because uh, some of you guys actually raised concern about uh, the difference in terms of the design philosophy between these two operating systems. Okay. Uh, so this uh, section, or rather this part, will be slightly more technical compared to. Uh, the one that we had last week. So uh, occasionally I will pause to answer any questions you guys might have, okay? Okay, so uh, some motivations to uh, get you started, right? So having a good UI actually leaves a good uh, first impression, right, for your user, right? It keeps your user engaged to carry on. And it also draws attention to important uh, areas on your application. Okay, but more importantly, it uh, achieve a very smooth and intuitive user flow. So if you are able to do that, then it kind of you know uh, evoke a few good aftertaste in your user because uh, maybe you know they have yet to experience a hiccup uh, from using your app. So a uh, user feel confident, user feel good uh, with using your app, right? And of course, a good UI can also associate with a uh, company branding, right? So good UI can result in higher conversion, which means revenue, right? Higher user engagement, right? And also set uh, a standard for the industry to follow, right? So in this case, uh, Google is the leading uh, industrial standard for Android uh, design, right? They introduce material design so that people developing on Android platform can follow suit. Right, uh, so first we talk about uh, visual cues, right, talk about colors, right, specifically how to choose your, your colors. So some uh, psychology uh, relating to colors, so first we have red, right, so when we talk about red, when we think about red, uh, you know, we are being recorded of appetite, we are being recorded Tension that we are being kind of powerful. So I think uh, Netflix is a company that uses a uh, red in their uh, in in their logo, right? Uh, to fulfill you know their users' appetite for multimedia. Then uh, we also have blue. I think Facebook uses blue, right? To you know 
to illustrate a sense of a community and also a sense of a security in using their application. Right? Apple mainly deploy black uh, in their user interface right? to uh, exhibit professionalism and uh, to actually tell you that their product is of a uh, high you know, value and uh, what they do are actually of serious matter. Okay, then we have orange, right? This actually uh, illustrates excitement and uh, sometimes uh, entertainment companies use orange uh, in their brand logo. Right, so Amazon, I think, uh, use orange, right? Yes, I think someone has a question. Okay, I think your, okay, your mic is on, right? Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, raise it up in the group chat, right? Okay, uh, so uh, back to Orange, right? Uh, so Amazon uses Orange because uh, they want to illustrate the excitement of their user whenever they receive uh, a parcel, right? Okay, what other colors do we have? Okay, we have yellow as well. Yellow actually symbolizes happiness, uh, friendly and warning. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the photo film uh, company Nikon uses it to uh, illustrate that happiness is captured in their film. I think it's a motto that they deploy a lot. Then uh, we also have Starbucks, right? Starbucks uses green, right? Uh, to indicate the freshness of their coffee bean and also, uh, you know, a, a, that, their, that their coffee is usually taken on the go, right? So in, in other words, outdoor, right? Then we also have a brown, right? So I think Old Town Coffee Bean uses brown, right? Uh, to indicate uh, vintage, to indicate uh, aroma in their coffee bean and to illustrate that their signature board is uh, reliable. So it's actually quite interesting because you see Starbucks and Old Town uh, actually sells coffee, right? But uh, one uses uh, green, the other one uses brown, right? Because uh, for Starbucks, uh, they are more uh, interested right, in using green to illustrate the freshness of their bean. But uh, for Old Town, they uh, want to build up a very reliable brand, right? And also a very vintage one, so they use brown. And of course, finally, we have purple, uh, YouTube, uh, sorry, not YouTube, Yahoo uses it, right? Uh, to illustrate wisdom because it's a search engine and also a news site. Okay, what about ping? Okay, this is an interesting one. Uh, ping is often associated with beauty, you know, uh, women clothing and also sensitivity. And most recently, people uh, have been using, uh, you know, ping for women's empowerment campaign, right? Like, uh, you know, breast cancer campaign, you know, a women's right movement, usually they use ping to illustrate such clause. Okay, so uh, there's also a company, right? This company uses ping. Uh, do anyone know which company this is? Anyone? Uh, you can just type your answer in the, uh, you know, in the chat or maybe just uh, speak out loud. So uh, actually, this uh, this company is uh, you know Kali Cosmetic, right? I think uh, I think Fifio will be uh, you know uh, more familiar with it, right? Okay, uh, colors also applies to UI components as well, right? Like buttons, right? So maybe if you use a red button, uh, it actually create an urgency. It creates a blood rush to actually trigger it. But if you use a blue button. Right, uh, maybe it can uh, evoke a sense of security, right, which actually speaks a lot about uh, what this button does, right? Uh, and the same applies for the colors as well. Right, so how do you choose a color theme or color palette, right? We try to keep it simple. I like to use the 60, 30, 10 rule, right? So how it works is we have three categories. Uh, three different colors, 
right? Uh, primary, secondary, and your accent. So your primary colors should cover 60% of your interface. Your secondary should cover 30% of your interface. Uh, the accent should cover the remaining 10% of your interface. This is how you should allocate your categories, right? So uh, in case if you think that, you know, three colors is not enough, you can uh, maybe introduce one more secondary color, right? But make sure that your secondary colors actually complements your uh, primary color, right? So uh, for primary is usually for background, for secondary is for your widget, for accents is all uh, is for your CTA, right? Which drives a uh, conversion. Okay, so here's an example of how, uh, you know, a uh, website uses the, you know, 60, 30, 10 rule. So my question to you guys is, uh, you know, which color do you think is the primary color? Is it white, uh, black, or yellow? <clears throat> Feel free to scribble your answer on the board, or just uh, you know, raise it, raise it up uh, on the chat itself. I try to make this session more engaging. Right? So, uh, anyone. So let's start with uh, white first, right? So white belongs to primary, secondary, or accent. Okay, uh, that's correct. How about black? Okay, that's correct. Oops. Uh, the last one is obviously your accent. Right? This is of course excluding the image, right? Because you have no control over the image. Right? The 10% actually can be found uh, on the top, right? This little yellow button. Okay, uh, this is actually very cool. You can even apply this concept to your fashion decision as well, right? So sometimes uh, you might have trouble trying to mix and match the colors uh, in, your, uh, in your outfit, right? So uh, how do we use it? So maybe uh, for this particular model, right, the color of a trench coat is actually made up of 60% uh, of her overall color combination, right? And then her shirt and pants uh, takes up the 30%. Then uh, the remaining 10% goes to the uh, Joe uh, necklace or what uh, designer called the finishing touch. Like, so this is actually very cool. It does not only apply to interface design, but it also uh, applies to uh, your choices of uh, color clothing as well. Okay, I'll give you uh, more examples. So uh, this is actually the color game that I used for my karaoke app. Uh, so like what the concept suggests, uh, three categories, primary, secondary, and accents, right? Uh, it's just that I use two color for my secondary. I use a violet and also a salmon. And of course, you can have your essential color as well, right? Your white, uh, your black, and your gray. Right, so if you were to follow this concept diligently, then you can come up with very intuitive, clean, and simple uh, user interface design like this. So, uh, you know, over here, we'll, I only deploy three colors, uh, yet manage to have a very clear visual hierarchy, right? Which uh, illustrates a sense of uh, simplicity and also a minimalistic approach to uh, designing. This is uh, the kind of standard. Uh, at least uh, for us to uh, uh, strive. Okay, so a uh, color model, uh, I think we have come across these three terms, right? Your hue, saturation, and value, right? So actually these are input fields uh, that you sometimes have to enter, right? Uh, on your color picker or color wheel when choosing a particular color. So uh, for hue, what is it? It is actually your base color, right? For saturation, uh, it actually talks about the intensity of your color. So higher saturation means uh, your color is more intense, lower means the opposite. Then the last one is value, right? This actually talks about uh, how light or dark your, your color is, right? So uh, I think the higher the value, uh, you know, the brighter it is, the lower the value, the 
darker it is, right? Uh, and also you might come across words such as thin, right? So thin is more of adding white uh, to your hue. So if you add white to your hue, uh, your color become more diluted, right? And then uh, you have uh, shades, which is the opposite. You add black to your hue. So maybe if you add black to say yellow, right? Then yellow will uh, turn into an uh, orange, right? Because uh, you have added sufficient uh, black to it, right? And then uh, if you add like gray, right? Uh, maybe your yellow will turn into a yellow orange instead. Right, any questions so far? Right, so these are just common terminologies that uh, you, know, you guys might come across when designing. Okay, uh, if no questions, uh, let's continue. <clears throat> okay, uh, we look at the color wheel. Color wheel has 12 colors, right? Uh, can be divided into three groups, primary, secondary, tertiary, right? Okay, so uh, don't confuse this primary, secondary, and theory concept with the 60 and 30, 10 rule. They are totally different things. The 60, 30, and 10, the primary is talking about the allocation of colors, right? But for color wheel, we are talking about the position of the color, right? In the color wheel, right? So for color combinations, Right, some of the combinations you can explore would be complementary. So these are colors on the opposite end of the spectrum that provides the highest contrast. Then we have split complementary. This is similar to complementary, just that you take two colors from the other end instead of one. A rectangle, you take a pair from each side. Then uh, triadic is uh, you take three colors of equal distance on the color wheel. Square, you take four colors. Okay, uh, and, and then this is uh, analogous, is you take neighboring color. I think this color uh, resembles more towards nature, right? Uh, which a designer are more fond of in terms of their color combination choices. Then uh, if you don't want to use uh, other hue, you just want to stick to one hue, then maybe you might want to consider using a monochromatic, right? So you can generate different variation of the same color, right? So in this case, I think we have a different thin or different shades of blue, right? But the more popular one is, uh, is this analog, analog, uh, analog uh, color combinations that is often adopted by uh, designer okay so my question to you guys is uh, how do we define this uh, color contrast in a color wheel right so uh, when we look at the left hand side we say that yellow and blue has a high contrast right uh, and then when we look at red and brown we say that this two color has a low contrast so, um, how do we define color contrast, right? Try to map it to the color wheel, right? And then you have your answer. So, uh, anyone knows the answer? Try to map it to the color wheel. <clears throat> so, so how do we define color contrast in a color wheel? Uh, pay attention to uh, the difference between uh, a high contrasting pair and a low contrasting pair on a color wheel. Anyone? Okay, I think uh, most of you guys get it, right? We are talking about, uh, yeah, so we are talking about distance here, right? So uh, it's actually the distance like, between the color in the color wheel because uh, when we look at yellow and blue, Right, obviously, uh, they are further apart from each other in comparison to red and brown. Right, red and brown is just neighboring, or red and orange, right? And also, we have this thing called contrast uh, checker. Right, uh, later if I have time, I can show you guys how to use it. Uh. But basically, it will test the contrast uh, ratio of two colors uh, to indicate that. Uh, you know, if it's suitable for your interface design. 
Okay, so if you don't know how to harmonize colors, you can always use a color generator, right? You don't really have to care about all those complicated concepts that I have talked about, right? So this really saves you a lot of time. But uh, if you are more dedicated and you want to choose your own colors, then uh, by all means, right, uh, choose a color combination that you like that I mentioned earlier. Try to play around with the contrast, right, and also uh, you know the different uh, uh, color uh, model elements. Okay, uh, any questions so far with regards to color? If no, let's talk a bit about fonts. Okay. So uh, for fonts, we also have uh, our own jargon, right? So maybe sometimes when you are choosing your font, uh, you might be greeted with very complicated settings, right? So maybe let's start off with font size. So font size is actually the unit of measurement for your font, right? Then uh, you also have your font type. Sometimes you might be asked to choose the font width. This is actually the thickness of your font. Okay, then you have your spacing between the words. And then you have your baseline that spans from the top of the text to the bottom of the text. And then uh, we have what we call the line uh, between uh, two lines of text. And then we have the line length. And then we have the line height uh, between two uh, lines. We also have the leading, right? Uh, this is actually the space between the vertical distance between two baseline, right? Two neighboring baseline. And then we have your kerning, right? This is actually your space between individual letters. Then for space between uh, letters in a word, we call it tracking. For space between letters throughout the text, we call it letter spacing, right? So hopefully, uh, if, whenever you are unsure about what these terms means, you can always refer to this uh, diagram. Okay? Okay, so how do we select font size, right? You know, we, we don't anyhow, you know, choose our font size. There's actually a concept towards it. So uh, for my take is I like to stick to five category of font size ranging from extra small to extra large for different emphasis. And I like to calculate my font size using this formula, right? Uh, 12 plus 2 to the power of n. 12 is your offset, uh, 2 is your base, right? Uh, n is your exponent, right? This formula actually gives you uh, the flexibility uh, to actually derive a font size uh, that is distinguishable from each other. Okay? Because you don't want your font size to be too similar to each other. So here's an example, right? I think for XS, this is 12 pixels. So in this case, the offset is what is 12. Then uh, your base is 2. But in this case, your N is raised to 0, right? Then uh, subsequently, our N increase. Then uh, for X, XL, uh, you know, we, it results in 28 uh, pixel. Okay, so, uh, you know, different fonts have different purposes. So XS is for terms and condition, usually quite small, right, for marketing reason. Then a uh, large, you know, can be applied to uh, bigger items like panel. Okay, the benefit of, uh, you know, using such a font size structure is it improves uh, data consumption right through better uh, legibility meaning to say that uh, your user can read better and comprehend better and it also creates consistency right across your uh, web page then it also eliminates uh, decision fatigue right uh, when designing you don't have to figure out you know what kind of font size to use just stick to the formula and you are good to go then, uh, you know, we can also achieve consistent scaling, right? When we resize our uh, browser window, and then the visual hierarchy is also stronger and more uh, cohesive, right? Something like this image on the bottom, right? Okay. So other recommendations that I like to propose. Uh, okay, so this is not really proposed by me. This is 
proposed by the different operating system. For iOS, they prefer using font size uh, greater or equals to 14 pixel. For Android, uh, slightly larger, you know, 18 pixel. Line length uh, recommended not too many, 30 to 40, you know, character per line. Uh, your line height should be obviously bigger than your font size by 20%. Uh, your font spacing should start from 10 to 20%, right? So try to configure all this uh, before you start uh, designing, right? Or maybe you have, if you have already started uh, designing, maybe uh, you, know, you might want to tweak, right? So that uh, you, know, you can achieve a more uh, you know, consistent and cohesive font size system. Okay, let's talk a bit about how you can go about using icons, right? Because we see icons everywhere. Okay, icons can be divided into three groups. Okay, the first one is representation. Uh, the second, we have actions. The last one, we have ideas. So for representative icons, usually they represent a company. They maybe represent a device or represents an age group or maybe represents a you know, particular function or department, right? So uh, it's very representative. For actions, uh, these are icons that actually prompt you to take a action that will trigger, right, a particular change towards your system. So for example, when you hit on X, you can expect a window to close and when you hit on the you know leftwards button, you can expect you know uh, this feature to take you back to the previous uh, page, right? Just to name a few. Then for ideas, this is more towards the uh, system status, right? I think all these icons uh, you guys should be familiar with because they can often be found in the notification header on top of your uh, mobile devices, right? Like your airplane mode, like your Wi-Fi signal. You know, then we also have this spinner, right, to indicate that our system is loading, right? So these three are actually uh, very, very different, right? So, uh, you know, when using icons, uh, you need to ask yourself what kind of, uh, you know, categories uh, are you uh, focusing on? Are you trying to represent something? Are you trying to, uh, you know, evoke an action from the user or are you trying to, you know, illustrate a status uh, with regards to your system, okay? So things to note, to pay attention to is uh, try to use, uh, you know, icons that has already been ingrained in the mind of your user. Okay, try to use a consistent icon. When I say consistent, it means that uh, the colors, the size, the weight should be the same, right? Throughout your uh, web page or your application. Okay, and try to avoid using icons with conflicted meaning like this uh, infamous star icon, right? So what does this star icon mean? Does it mean favorite? Does it mean bookmark? Or does it mean red, right? So maybe you want to consider using a unique, um, a unique icons that can better represent each system. Or if you are unable to do so, so just scrap the idea of using icons and use label instead, okay? So this is like what I've said, using labels to clarify uh, abstract icons. And also for representations, uh, you want to be very clear. So you use a very unique icons, right? So in this case, I think this is the uh, Pokemon company, right? Using a Pokemon, a very uh, unique icon that cannot be found in other contexts. Okay, and also, uh, you know, there's icons that is platform specific. So for example, uh, when we are talking about share button, the appearance is very, very different uh, in uh, iOS and Android, right? So the first one is iOS, then the letter is Android. So this is something that you want to pay attention to, so as to not confuse your user. Okay, I think one person has a question. So uh, I think YY is talking about regarding the font size just now, are we talking about the web or app application? Uh, which slide are you talking about? Are you talking about this font size? 
this one uh, is mainly talking about app. Right? This 14 pixel is for iOS app, 18 pixel is for uh, Android app. Then uh, for the size, for the sizing formula, you can apply it to all kinds of platform, right? So this uh, formula it does not comply to only a specific platform, but you can use it for all kinds of platform. So this formula always goes. Okay, I hope that clarifies your question. Is there a universal icon for share? Unfortunately, no, right? For share icon, uh, iOS and Android use a very different icon. Right? Let's see, yes. Right? So, uh, and it's also not a good idea to come up with your own icons. Otherwise, people might uh, you know, misunderstand it to be a representative icon, right? So this is something to take note of, okay? So if you really, really, really want to use unrecognizable icon, right? Uh, one trick is to group it with similar icons. La. At least you can hint or suggest what it does by a uh, helping user to connect with other similar icons right so for example sometimes when you play game uh, you know when you see an icon you don't know whether is it an inventory item or you don't know whether is it a skill item huh? but when you put it put uh, you know these icons uh, amongst the other skill then uh, it clearly or evidently you know that it is a skill button instead of a uh, inventory uh, button, inventory item button, sorry. Right, likewise for this uh, utility, uh, you know, menu bar on Photoshop, like, you know, this uh, this bar actually comprise of a lot of different uh, utility uh, uh, tools, right, and some of it might be foreign to you guys, right, but if you look at the neighboring uh, utilities, sometimes it might suggest what uh, you know, this foreign utility actually does, right? So this is one example uh, to group it together with similar uh, icon, right? And uh, if really no choice, then just use a label instead. Uh, this is the most straightforward way, right? And uh, if you use a label, maybe you don't even need an icon, right, to accompany it. Okay, so the position of the icon uh, is actually quite critical, uh, right? Let me just illustrate. Right, if you put your icons on the left, right, it becomes a subject. Then whatever follows becomes the description, right. So if we do the opposite, like what happened? Our icons becomes the description, right. Whatever uh, that user see at the beginning will be the subject, right. So to make it clear, left is for subject, right is for description, right. So the diagram uh, on your right, right, looks more like a report. The diagram on your left looks more like a legend. So uh, be very careful on how you place uh, your icons, right? And to take advantage of this position, try to keep your icons as close as your as close to your label as possible, right? So that uh, you know user can interpret it as a single entity. Okay. Okay, we talk about size because it matters, right? So, uh, you know, iOS and Android has different touch target, right? IOS, iOS suggests that their elements has minimally uh, 44 times 44 pixel. For Android, is 48 times 48 pixel, slightly bigger, right? This is uh, the touch target, uh, or rather the UI element, right, that, uh, that they use in their interface, right? So uh, let's look at the finger size chart, right? So on the right is actually a finger size chart. So, uh, you know, most of us fall under 11 mm. This is the size of our uh, finger tip, right? This is around 41 pixel. That's why they suggested using, you know, 44 pixel and 48, right? Which is closer to 11 mm. Like baby slightly smaller, right? Less than 8 mm. Then, uh, you know, Person with the people with the largest uh, finger would be basketball player because they can go up to 19 mm, that's about 71 uh, pixel. So, maybe to give you a sense of how long that is, it's actually uh, twice 
the length of a uh, average adult finger. So it's quite insane. Okay, so uh, how can we calculate uh, you know, the kind of sizes that we want to use? So remember the formula, like this 12 plus 2 power of n, we can also use it uh, when calculating the size of our element, right? So uh, in this case, I think 7 is the offset, 3 is the base, 1 is the ex exponential. Then subsequently, as, as, it, uh, as you move to bigger uh, elements, right? Uh, the exponent increase, but your offset and base remains unchanged. If you don't follow, right, if you anyhow choose, then this is what you will look like. It's very messy, right? There's no clear sizing involved. It's very difficult for a user to actually comprehend the information on your user interface. Okay, any questions regarding how to use this formula? Okay, I have no questions. Uh, let's continue. Right, so if you are very lazy, you know, you can always refer to the material design style by Google. There's a website that actually tells you what kind of size you should use for each element, right? So this is like a guideline. Uh, by the way, there's no like, you know, a very uh, hard or rather very stringent rule with regards to size. As long as the visual hierarchy is very clear, right? All these tips and tricks that I shared with you is to help you achieve a clear and coherent visual hierarchy, right? And it also helps you to reduce decision fatigue so you guys don't have to think so hard on what kind of colors, what kind of font, what kind of size, what kind of spacing to use, okay? Okay, uh, someone raised a question, right? So for font sizing, is this only relevant when we use the same uh, font type? So ideally, uh, when you are designing an app, you should always stick to one uh, font type, right? So uh, this font sizing will apply to that particular font type. Right? Unless obviously you are trying to uh, if you are trying to create a font website, then obviously you have many different fonts. Then that's a different case. But I think for most of us, we are only sticking to one font, right? And uh, I think the default for Android is Roboto, right? And I think the default for uh, Apple is uh, San Francisco. Hmm. Okay, then another question uh, she raised is because different font type may look different in terms of sizing. Okay, so uh, again, if you are using one font type, then this doesn't matter anymore, right? Because all your sizing concepts only apply to that particular font type. Okay, uh, as much as possible, try to stick to one font type. Right? You cannot have one page using Roboto and another page using San Francisco. Then people might think it's, it's an Android or an iOS app. So it's very, uh, you know, uh, unkeen and untidy. Okay. Uh, of course, you can use your own uh, font type also, someone mentioned. Okay, uh, spacing. Mm. Okay, so uh, one good thing about spacing is that it draws attention, right? So it's actually very amazing, you know, because uh, given that, you know, the elements that we, the, 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 the target board that we have in the middle of the slide is very small, yet we are able to see it. And we, furthermore, we are able to even, uh, you know, view the text uh, inside of it and uh, the reason is because of the white space that is uh, that uh, envelops this uh, particular element right to help us you know zero in on uh, the element that we should pay attention to a very very powerful image okay uh, this applies to content as well if you add sufficient spacing you know uh, around your content, then it will help your user to focus the content better, right? So obviously the second one looks better. Okay, uh, and also spacing can help to separate information, right? So this is actually a very bad example, right? Uh, you have the same spacing between the uh, elements, right? So it actually becomes very difficult to group them. Like you don't know 
uh, whether a label actually matches to which of the placeholder, right? But if you were to bring them close together, the grouping logic becomes very, very clear, right? We can see that, you know, uh, a group comprised of one label and one placeholder. So this is what we should strive to achieve. Okay. Uh, this applies to text also, right? So uh, if you have too much spacing, it's also not very good, right? Because uh, you are separating them into uh, different entities, which is not the case uh, for text, especially uh, when we are talking about uh, you know text within the same paragraph. Okay, so uh, here are some shortcuts that uh, I think you guys might come across uh, to help to manipulate the space between elements, right? So for alignment, we have things like align left, align middle, right, top, center, and bottom, right? Uh, often we will choose to align left, right? Because when we read a uh, sentence, we read from left to right. But uh, this only applies to English. Uh. If, you are, uh, if you are designing an app, or uh, in Arabic, then you should align right because uh, Arabic, I think, is you know read from uh, right to left instead of left to right. So uh, something to take note of. I think for most cases, we are using you know English right as our primary language in our user interface. So align left right for your text content. For distribution, we can distribute vertically with equal uh, spacing in between elements or horizontally. Right, so one is the y-axis, another one is the x-axis. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, uh, otherwise, let us continue. Okay, resolution. We like to work with the number 8y. Because if you realize that the common uh, dimension is being adopted across a uh, device type, uh, usually the figures are divisible by 8. So, Google actually recommends 8 pixel spacing between elements to accommodate a wide range of devices. At the same time, uh, you know, when you migrate from one device to another device, you know, your interface can still look sharp because uh, it's being scratched uh, equally from all angles okay uh, okay uh, ui components let's talk a bit about buttons right uh, this is something that we use uh, everywhere on our app but we want to use it strategically of course okay so for button types three categories also we have your call to action we have your primary we have your secondary First one is your CTA. This is the most prominent and eye-catching button, right? This is responsible for bringing you the revenue and conversion that you need, right? Then uh, we have primary buttons. Uh, this is for user to this is to assist user in completing their user journey, right? Uh, and I think this is a floating uh, button. This only works for Android, or rather, this is only used for Android, if I'm not wrong. Uh, secondary, these are buttons that is opposed to the action of primary, right? Uh, this you can use it. You you can use what we call a ghost button uh, without any uh fill in it, or you can use a button without uh, any borders, right, surrounding it. So I'll give you an example. So for Airbnb, their CTA is actually very clear and prominent, right? And you realize that uh, you know in this page they don't really have a lot of buttons, but only one, uh, which actually induces you know the user to actually click on it to get started. And then this is the login page for Twitter, right? We have your sign up and login, right? So uh, sometimes you might have doubt, you know, whether sign up should be primary or secondary. So to clear your doubt, uh, you know the default button should always be primary right so in this case sign up is the default primary sorry is the default button that's why it should be the primary uh, button right and login should be the secondary instead 
Right. And when I say default button is the button that you want your user to click on, uh, you know, when they arrive on a particular page. Okay, I hope this is clear. If it's still not clear, then just use arrow to point towards the button, right? So this will actually direct uh, our line of sight towards the uh, intended element, okay? So we also have tertiary buttons. Uh. This is uh, actually elements like checkbox and radio buttons. Then we have your toggle switches. You can switch between on and off. But uh, this is different from uh, toggle buttons, right? Because toggle buttons actually toggles uh, between contextual state. So what I meant by this is that uh, when you toggle it, the change is applied to the current context. But for a toggle switch, when you switch it on and off, the switch applies to the entire system state, right? So uh, this is for the entire system state. This is for the current context. And then we have your common navigational link. We have your tabs. Then we have your back. Okay. Okay, so some selector uh, that you might have come across, right? Uh, and you might be wondering how to decide, you know, uh, using them. So uh, let's go through column by column, right? So for radio button is designed to work alongside with other radio buttons, right? Uh, you don't usually see one standalone radio button, but rather you see a list of uh, radio buttons, right? And then uh, the choices you can make is from one to all, right? Because radio buttons uh, always has a default selection, right? So it starts from one and ends uh, infinite. Then a state you can either select or unselect it. Then uh, the outcome is choices and states are mutually exclusive, meaning to say that, uh, you know, uh, the outcome of maybe an event A happening does, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, maybe uh, it meant that, you know, both events cannot happen at the same time. Okay, so example will be if your button is selected, it cannot be unselected at the same time. So this is what I meant by uh, mutually exclusive. Then for checkbox like radio buttons, uh, it's also meant to work alongside with other checkboxes. Then available choices, because checkbox, you don't have a default uh, selection, so you can start from zero and ends at uh, infinite. Then uh, number of selection is the same as well. Uh, your state can be checked or unchecked. For the outcome, it's slightly different because choices are independent, then states are mutually exclusive. Uh, what I meant by choices are independent means that uh, the outcome of uh, one choice does not affect the probability of another choice occurring right they are independent okay uh, then for toggle switch uh, you know they can be used as a standalone itself right and the choices is either you on it or you off it right uh, you can either choose one right state will be two state then uh, outcome is like radio button choices and states are mutually exclusive then uh, last but not least we have your toggle button right uh, they are designed to use alongside with other toggle buttons. Then uh, we have a default pre-selection, so it starts from one, ends at infinite, then state is activated or unactivated, right? You either toggle it or you don't. Okay, then, uh, you know, like toggle switch choices and states are mutually exclusive. Okay, uh, we have other criteria as well. These are more simple criteria. Okay, radio buttons uh, have pre-selection, checkbox, yes or no, toggle switch has pre-selection, toggle button also has pre-selection, right? And uh, it's good to note that radio buttons and checkbox requires confirmation, right, upon uh, checking them. Then toggle switch and toggle buttons, right, the, the effect is uh, instantaneous. Uh, so when you tap on it, there's no turning back, right? There's no confirmation, uh, you know, button. Right, uh, and then for radio buttons and uh, checkbox is either uh, the effect is either applied to the entire system or the current context. But for toggle switch is strictly the entire system. That's why you often see toggle switch in uh, the settings of uh, our mobile phone. 
right? Then for toggle buttons is uh, mainly contextual. Okay, uh, any questions regarding all these, uh, you know, differentiations and jargons? I just, uh, this can be a bit hard, you know, to process, but eventually, uh, you know, you guys will be familiar and make a better choice when it comes to uh, selectors, right? So maybe to help you understand better, okay, let's uh, do a simple uh, quiz. So maybe for agreement to terms and condition, what kind of selector should we use? Anyone? Right. Any, any, anyone knows the answer to this? Agreements to terms and condition. Yes, checkbox. Do you know why it's a checkbox? Because when it comes to sensitive information like this, usually you require a confirmation to it. Right? It doesn't make sense to use like a toggle switch, right? Where the result is instantaneous. Right? Okay, let's move on. How about airplane mode? Okay, toggle switch. This uh this is actually correct because we expect the result. To, uh, we expect the changes to be applied instantaneously across the entire system. Okay, how about filter options? Okay, checkbox. This is correct because usually we have more than one and we definitely requires uh, a submission, right, to submit uh, our configuration. And also good to know that uh, you know sometimes you don't have to check all of the filter options. You can leave it uh, unchecked, right? How about list view versus map view? Okay, this is correct. Uh, contextual, yes, contextual. So in this case, is a toggle button, right? Uh, and it also doesn't make sense to use uh, like a checkbox, right? Because you need to have a default pre-selection, right? Okay, rating system. Uh, anyone? Rating system. Anyone rating system? <laughs> so uh, it's actually toggle uh, button, right? Uh, sorry, radio button, right? So uh, it's important to note that for radio button, right, you need to have more than one radio button in order for this entire system to work, right? Because if you only have one radio button, how are you going to unselect it? So the only way to unselect the existing options is to tap on the other. Okay, so this is something to take note of. Okay, and you can even improve your user interface by using a icon, right? So I think in this case, even maybe a style icon might not be a good choice because it can be misleading, but you guys get the idea, right? And then, uh, you know, you can even make uh, your label to be more uh, coherent. Mm, by uh, you know describing what it does right rather than just putting an okay because okay doesn't uh, talk much about what happens next okay uh, okay my tips for you guys is to use intuitive uh, label right so uh, try to avoid uh, you know the first example where we use very very descriptive label use a very clear and concise label like uh, like that on the right right like when i see this button i know immediately that uh, you know this button actually exceeds and save my game rather than you know having to go through a uh, word by word in each uh, sentence to understand what it does so the latter is uh, definitely much more preferred so here's another question is which one do you think uh, you know is a good choice for permanently discarding an item. So the keyword is permanent. Is it the first one or the second one? Right? Obviously, it's delete, right? 
because remove doesn't tell you whether is it a permanent or a temporary delete, right? Like who knows, maybe it might end up in your junk folder, right? So be careful on the choice of label, okay? Uh, avoid generic label, right? Well, this is very confusing, right? So, uh, you know, when you see this model, it asks you, are you sure you want to cancel? Okay, and then cancel. So the thing is, if I hit okay, am I canceling it or am I dismissing the action? Then when I hit canceling, am I agreeing to this initiative? So, you know, it's very blurry, it's very fuzzy. So, uh, try not to do this, right? Use uh, words like delete or discard instead, right? Then sometimes you have to plant your button in a process, right? Like maybe like a checkout, which involves multiple stages, right? Then uh, sometimes, you know, when people are checking out, they are paying money, they might, you know, they, they might be very sensitive, right? To what uh, each step actually does. So it's actually good that in your button label, you can actually hint uh, what it actually does the next, uh, in the next stage, right? Rather than just putting in, you know, this button done in every stage, then uh, people might get, you know, afraid, right, of using your, your, your application because they don't know, say, if they are performing a transaction, uh, what happens when they hit done, you know? Uh, would they be, you know, would, 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 their, would their bank account be deducted or would they be taken to a, uh, you know, OTP verification stage? You know, you don't know, right? So, uh, another thing when it comes to tax, we try to avoid negation. Right? I give you an example. Right, the first one is a bad example, right? Don't send me more email. So, you know, when you check it, it means don't send me more email. When you uncheck it, what does it mean? So, you know, it's, um, it's not very clear to me. Try to use positivity, like send me more email, right? Because uh, when you use something like this, uh, I know that when I check it, I'm actually sending, uh, I'm actually asking, you know, uh, the site to send me more email. Then if I'm unchecking it, means that I'm not subscribing to this feature. So use positivity instead. Okay, uh, offer a backup option. Okay, so sometimes obviously your radio button cannot accommodate all kinds of options. So always have a plan B, right? In this case for occupations, you know, obviously we have other occupations as well, right? Even though we are agents, you know, we, people always say, you know, we need to be a lawyer, we need to be a doctor, but no, you know, uh, there are other occupations as well that falls under others right okay and also not all buttons requires labor right so when you have very intuitive uh, buttons you know, like you know your recycle bin uh, you know your your home your settings you don't really need a uh, label to accompany it because uh, you know labor actually take up a significant amount of space okay uh Bonus tip is include ellipses in labels when uh, more information is required, especially when you need to describe your, your buttons uh, if it's not very, very clear. So, uh, you know, you include ellipses to suggest that, you know, if you hover on it, you can actually see some uh, two tip message that specify what it actually does. Okay? Because uh, sometimes it's really impossible for us to, you know, really uh, come up with a very clear and intuitive uh, label, right, for our buttons. Because sometimes the button might be doing more than one feature. Okay, uh, buttons, okay, at this point, any questions? Is it too much? Okay, so button states. Uh, so I think in your CSS, you will see all these kind of different states, right? So let me just go through so you guys will know, right? What kind of uh, styling you can apply to the respective state. So uh, first off the bat, we have hover. So this happens when your cursor actually uh, hovers over the button, right? Then next we have focus. So this is actually the feedback when you, uh, you know, when you click on it, 
or when you tap on it, right? And what this actually does is uh, the styling actually draws attention to the focus element, right? Like sometimes uh, they might style it such that it adds like a dotted uh, border around it, right? And for input view, uh, you know, uh, you know that it's in a focus state when the border is highlighted, right? Some example. Then how about active? So this is uh, the state when you press on it, right? So uh, it kind of get it kind of get activated when the mouse is down, okay. Then disabled is rather clear cut. This is uh this represents a state like, where the button is not a uh, usable, and this actually disallow any user's action until you fulfill a certain condition, right? Then, uh, you know, try to uh, style it such that uh, your hover takes uh, precedence over focus, your focus takes precedence over active, so that there's no overlap in between, okay? Try to arrange it uh, in this uh, order of precedence in your CSS. Okay, so uh, achieving a different state color, how we can do this, right? You know, just now, you just now I've shown you like different uh, button states. So uh, how we can go on achieving the different color variation is say if you want a lighter variation, you can increase the brightness and decrease the saturation, right? Then you can maybe you can get a disabled state. If you want a darker variation, you do the opposite. You drop down the brightness and then you push up the saturation, right? Okay, this is the last uh, section, right, on our eye movement. Uh, this one talks about uh, how user actually reads and engages their eyes when it comes to user uh, interaction. Okay, so research have actually shown uh, two kinds of reading pattern, right? One is the F shape, which is uh, more for text heavy page. The other one is the Z shape, right? For a page that is uh, minim with minimal copies and sometimes filled with images. So this is what I'm talking about. So uh, why is it called F shape? F means faster, right? So how this kind of reading behavior comes about is because, right, as user, we don't have time to actually spend time to read each sentence, each word one by one, right, which actually give rise to this kind of reading pattern. And sometimes we don't even read, right? We scan. So for F-shaped pattern, how, is, how it works is first, our eyes will be directed on the top left. Then it will scan horizontally across to the right. Right? And then we will do so for the subsequent line, but shorter. Why is it shorter? Because we already have sufficient context from uh, our previous sentence. Right? And then eventually, uh, it will get smaller and smaller, and you know, eventually we don't have to read uh, further down, right? The article, right? So for Z shape, uh, the starting point is also similar, right? We put our eyes on the top left. We scan from left to right, right? Then we scan down towards the left of the image, right? Which kind of create an imaginary uh, diagonal uh, line, right? Because uh, you know, uh, as humans, we are more, uh, we are more attracted to uh, images, right? And then what happened is that uh, you know, uh, when we reach the bottom, then uh, we will go back to the right, which eventually leads us to the CTA, which is also uh, our final destination. Uh. So in this case, I think Facebook wants you to. Sign up uh, in this page so that they can generate a, a bigger, you know, user base, right? So what does this mean for us? So if we can understand how uh, our user are engaging their eyes in terms of content design, uh, we know that we should keep our headline short uh, and concise, especially when we have more than one uh, paragraph, right? And then important information should be stored in the first two paragraphs, right? Because uh, if you store info important information in the subsequent paragraph, you know that your user will not spend a lot of time reading it, right? But 
if you want your user to continue reading it, it needs to be interesting enough, right? So another strategy will be to split your content into two columns, right? To minimize scrolling as well as to take advantage of the first word emphasis because usually we pay more attention to the beginning of the sentence, right? Uh, which is what we call the first word emphasis. And then uh, if uh, somehow along the way you want to capture uh, your audience attention back, then maybe you want to use bullet points, right? Uh, in the middle of your content. Okay, so then how about layout design, right? When it comes to Z pattern. Okay, so from Z pattern, we know that we need to place our logo hit lines on the top left where our eye starts, right? Then we want to fill the Z path with very useful information so that you know when we reach uh, uh, the final destination, which is the call to action, user would have already have sufficient information to make a decision. Then we want to position information either on the left side or right side, right? If you put it on the right side, you are giving uh, your user enough time to actually process this information. Right? But if you put it in the left side, sometimes it might not be ideal because immediately after reading a text, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, you are actually rushing your user to make a decision. Uh, and also, you should lay out your elements vertically downwards like, in descending priority. So the most important elements should come first. So here's a, a diagram to illustrate the Z pattern. So you have your logo on the left side. Then if you move uh, to the right, right, uh, we see some secondary button, right? And then uh, when we move down and to the left along the way, uh, we will be visited, right? Uh, we will be visiting right, some text and also images to help us uh, make an informed decision. Then finally, you know, uh, we scan our eyes to the right and then uh, we will be able you know, uh, 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 to decide whether or not we want to engage with the call to action button. Okay, so uh, knowing how your user eye works is very, very important, right? So what about images, you know, how does it uh, sit with uh, these two reading patterns? Right, so as humans, right, we are naturally drawn to images when there's human face involved, right? So because we are so used to seeing, uh, you know, humans and also, uh, you know, human faces every day in our life. So definitely, if you have images that has human face or uh, you know human gesturing a certain action, it will definitely capture our attention, right? So for what I mean by gesturing, so for example, you can see uh, this guy is trying to uh, you know gesture towards the company product, right? It's actually pointing towards the company product. So uh, our line of sight will actually be drawn towards the product instead, right? Uh, and is being directed by his finger that is pointing towards the product. Okay, so uh, images can be very useful if you know how to choose your images uh, wisely. Right, especially if you are trying to sell a product in a website. Okay, and then one more thing is the expression also matters a lot, right? You wouldn't want a person, you know, that looks unhappy when, uh, you know, he or she is demonstrating your app. Right, you want the person to look enthusiastic about the product that he is trying to sell uh, on your app, on your website. Okay. Okay. So here are some uh, just stock principles. These are very old and common principles that uh, you know designers still follow so nowadays. Okay. If you are, I think if you are taking design modules in the future, you will definitely come across some of them. So uh, some of the key idea would be, you know, as humans, we prefer to see things in complete shape, right? And if it's incomplete, we'll try to fill up the missing information in our head. So maybe even though a circle might be incomplete in our head, we try to complete it so that it makes sense to us. Okay, then uh, when we have lines, uh, the human eyes will tend to follow and flow with the line because it acts as a line of direction. 
then humans will try to notice convex shape before concave ones because convex shape are usually more protruding right it can better represent items in the foreground so we tend to pay attention to items in the foreground first than the background right so uh, we also seek stability like what i've mentioned we are always uh, you know more attracted to items in the foreground than the background right then we try to group items that are close together so that it makes sense to us then we try to group uh, items that are connected right as a single entity then we also try to seek balance and order in our design right so that we can able to better comprehend uh, a particular design or a particular say a content right so we try to subconsciously uh, organize uh, key ideas so that it flows and resonates with us okay uh okay here comes the ios versus android okay uh i actually don't have a lot of uh, time to actually create these slides to talk about the key distinction uh, but we will use a website to help us you know to do this right okay so first of all uh, one key difference is for ios ios use material design android use human interface guideline right so they have their own sites which list down the different uh, design principle so uh, it's good to actually take a look at them uh, if we are designing a native mobile app okay but uh, if you are designing for a mobile app in general rather than a native app then uh, more likely you know my recommendation is to go for the android uh hey, sorry i think uh i think someone mentioned that uh, you know my my labels are placed incorrectly oh, sorry the first one should be android the second one should be ios right so um Android follows the material design, iOS follows the human interface guideline. Let me quickly change it. Uh, sorry. Mm. Okay, so, uh, yep, sorry for the confusion. But Android actually deploys material design, iOS actually follows human interface guideline. Right? So uh, just now I was mentioning that if you are not designing a native app, uh, my suggestion is to go with the Android uh, design principle, right? Uh, because uh, Android takes up a larger market share in the mobile uh, in the mobile OS industry. Okay. Okay, iOS versus Android. Uh, iOS use San Francisco, right? So uh, when you know the font size becomes bigger uh, from 20 onwards all the way to 34, I think they are using San Francisco Pro display. Anything that is smaller, they are using San Francisco, San Francisco UI display. I think you can download this font on their website. Then for Android, it's very simple. Uh, they are using Roboto throughout the entire span of uh, font sizes from 10 all the way to 34. Uh, notice that uh, they are all using even numbers, right? They are not using odd. Right? This is to facilitate uh, scalability across uh, you know, different uh, device dimension. Okay, I have a few useful readings, right? Uh, you guys can go and check it out. Okay, uh, at this stage, uh, any questions? Otherwise, I want to show you a tool that is uh, quite interesting. The one that I want to talk about, the contrast tool. So uh, you can check this tool for the contrast checker. so actually what is what it does is uh you know if you input your color in a input a particular color in the foreground and input a particular color in the background then it will calculate and show you whether you know uh, the result is ideal or not 
So maybe we can test between uh, yellow and blue, right? I so blue is uh zero 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 f f f. I think yellow is uh o f and four zero, right? Oh, sorry, this is three f. Right. So as you can see, uh, you know the contrast is there. And most of the use cases actually pass the contrast test, right? Because blue and yellow are uh, has high contrast and they are further apart on the color wheel, right? Okay, so now let's try, uh, you know, maybe I don't know, red and brown. I think red is uh, red is double F and four zero. Brown, I'm not very sure. Okay, I think brown is this color. So obviously we can see that it fills most of the use cases, right? So you might want to use this tool to actually check whether you know uh you are able to pass the contrast test. Right? So this is actually a very cool uh, tool. Then there's also another tool that I would like uh, to share with you. This is called uh, wire, wire, wire fire or something. Wire fire. This is actually a plugin. I think there's no E. So this plugin actually allows you to steal wireframe from uh, you know website so for example say uh, I want to steal the wireframe from Apple right because they always create very nice design I want to know how they lay out their element right so after you download the plugin right it it becomes like a bookmark so what happens is you see uh, you know Apple has very nice website when you hit this button you know it will turn into a wireframe instead so this actually gives you an idea how they arrange the UI element. Then you can steal from them in terms of layout. No, and uh, I think even face even Facebook, right? You can steal, right? Or oh, Facebook, you can't steal. <laughs> right, Facebook, you can't steal. Uh, yeah, I think there's security feature put in place. Right, yeah, so so this is uh this is some uh you know example on how you can use uh this this plugin right here. Then uh for phones, just now I talk a lot about phones. Uh I usually like to download Android phones from uh Google phones because uh usually phones over there are usually the most uh authentic one I would say and the most complete one, right? Complete meaning to say that uh, it has a uh, italic, it has bow, right? It also has your regular and light. So I like to download from here. Okay. It has a library of fonts. Uh. There's actually a lot. Right, which is very cool. Then uh, another very cool website is, uh, let me see. Is good UI pattern, right? So actually, this website will show you some of the common UI design and which one you should choose, right? So in terms of layout, let's say uh there's A and B, right? Usually people will prefer using B, right? So you can see more of these such example, right? Uh, Okay, I think you need to pay money. Last time it was free though. Yeah. Yeah, I think they got greedy. Eh? No, no, you have to pay money. Ah, here, here, here. You can go to leaks. Then you can look at, uh, you know, uh, which uh design interface is preferred by the general audience you know you know whether is it to put your cta on the right side or you put your cta at the bottom right 
So actually, this can give you some suggestion on how you can lay out your element. Which is very cool. So all this research has been done by other people. Uh, you don't really have to uh, do it yourself. You just have to, uh, you know, adopt the results from their research, right? So for this case, uh, you know, people prefer having a label placed alongside with an icon instead of using two icons, right? Which, uh, which can be very confusing for customer. Okay, uh, this is a very cool website. You can spend some time to look at it. Okay, okay uh, any questions so far? I think we ended earlier than usual. I hope it's cool. Then also another another thing uh, that uh, you know we can explore is actually the key difference between iOS versus Android, right? So here it talks about you know minimum touch target iOS is forty four, Android is forty eight, right? And also uh you know what kind of navigation are they using? iOS deploys a uh, bottom navigation for user to move around. Then Android use steps on top of the screen, right? Things like that. But another key difference is that uh, you know, uh, if I'm not wrong, let me see. Uh, for 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 iOS, usually there's a compulsory back button, right? Uh -huh. Right. With iOS, there's the compulsory back button, right? Because uh, it's not like uh, Android where you know, uh, you have a default uh, system back button at the bottom, right? So this is another key difference, right? Android you can choose uh to put the back button on top or not, but uh at least. You know, for Apple, I think uh, for iOS, it's compulsory, right? If not, user won't be able to navigate back. Or you can put a hamburger menu, you know, which actually pulls out a navigation uh, menu that allows you to navigate back to your previous page, right? So, uh, you know, be careful, right, with the choice of uh, devices and operating system you are designing for. Right. Uh, there's also a lot of other differences, but I think I have uh, list out some of the key ones. Right. There's actually a few more. I think you guys can actually uh, go through. Mm -hmm. Right. Then uh, you know, it's so granular that uh, they even talk about how they clip your application icon. Right. Okay, uh, any questions? Okay, uh, there's one question. So, uh, if we were to make a cross-platform app, do we have to make two separate designs or is there a way to balance out? So, like what I've mentioned, if you are trying to make a cross-platform app, meaning to say that if you have a single version that caters to two, uh, two, different, uh, you know, two different operating systems, uh, most likely a mobile app. Then my suggestion is to adopt the Android um, uh, Android design principle. But if you are creating a native app, you have no choice but to stick to the respective design principle uh, for the uh, you know the operating system you are designing for. You guys know the difference between a uh, native app and also mobile app, right? Mobile app are apps that you can access uh, using your Safari and Chrome. Native app are apps that you can access from your Google Store and Play Store. Sorry, uh, your Play Store and App Store. So this is something you have to take note of because I know for Apple, they are very strict about it. If you don't follow, then they won't deploy your app on their App Store. Okay? Yeah, so so uh, hopefully you know uh, this is something that you should that you will keep in mind uh, when you become a designer in the future. 
right? Because this actually distinguish between an amateur uh, designer and also uh, an experienced designer, right? You want to, you know, during a discussion, you want to uh, bring out certain, uh, you know, points uh, that is worthy for discussion, right? Uh, to actually showcase your understanding about user interface design and also you know showcase that you are actually trying to design for a wide range of audience across a wide range of device type. Okay, uh, any other question? Will you be? I have already submitted the. Uh, I have already uploaded the slides right on Slack. I don't know whether you guys have joined yet. Let's see, uh, this is. Uh, here, here, this one. You need to join the Slack channel, you know. Uh, mission control for UI UX part two. Right, uh, part one Slack can be found uh, in the other channel. So there's two channel, one, uh, one channel for each part, right? So hopefully, I uh, I have consolidated all the key uh, items that you should take note of when designing, you know, uh, for your orbital project. And then uh, hopefully you can use this as a cheat sheet uh, to actually reference it across when uh, you are experiencing a design uh, dilemma when choosing between say a font size, choosing between uh, spacing, colors, uh, etc. Okay, any other questions? Any thoughts and sharing on accessibility feature? Accessibility feature, you mean like, you know, designing for those with visual impairment, are you talking about that? Or are you talking about designing for different age group? What, what kind of accessibility are you talking about? Okay, so for people with visual uh, impairment, I think actually Google uh, provide you a feature that you are able to use this, right? Uh, Google designing for the visual impair. So actually, if I'm not wrong, uh, they will use their they will use their own API, right? And then uh. When you hit a button, let's say with a label, you will actually read aloud uh, to you, right? So uh, the requirement is that you need to have a short description for every element, right? Then uh, Google will be able to convert it uh, using their speech to text feature. Sorry, their text to speech feature, right? So, so let's say obviously if you have visual impairment, you won't be able to see all this, right? So maybe for your element, let's say your get started element, you need to you need to insert like a short description. You need to put in a, an additional effort of adding a short description. So when you use the when you use their Google uh, uh you know API or the Chrome extension, right? Uh, it will actually read out the description, uh, right? Because obviously the person can only hear it. The person has problems, uh, you know. Uh, seeing things, so this is uh, one way of uh, you know how designers go about or how developers go about uh, addressing uh, audiences with uh, physical uh, disability. Yeah, I think uh, there are other problems that uh, you know people face, right? And also, I think. Um, for people with you know a uh, visual uh, disability, uh, I'm not talking about complete blindness. Uh, that one is different. Uh, they there's certain colors that you know uh, there's certain colors that they can see better than the rest, and also there's certain colors that they cannot see uh, compared to the uh, masses, right? So uh, thin colors that you know. Colors 
So as you can see, it says that bright color are generally easier for those that are, that are suffering from visual impairment, right? Because of their ability to reflect light. So uh, you might want to consider using bright colors like red, orange, and yellow, right? And also, I think this chart showcases a type of color deficiency. Okay, uh, any other questions? Feel free to raise it up or, you know, voice out. So, uh, Joshua mentioned that, you know, should you design our native app using one screen size first, iPhone 8 size, no notch, before making it responsive to fit, uh, you know, bigger screen sizes? latest iPhones with notch? Okay, this is actually a very good question. So uh, with regards to this, right, because yeah, you are actually having the dilemma whether you should design it for people using iPhone 8 or you know iPhone X because the design is very different. So I can show you. So iPhone 8 and iPhone X, one has notch, one doesn't have notch. So you see, iPhone X has this very infamous notch on top, right? Then uh, iPhone 8 doesn't have it, right? And uh, usually, you know, for uh, an iOS app, uh, the title is usually placed in the center, right? But for the latest uh, iPhone X, you cannot do that, right? Because uh, it's being covered by this notch. So I think now uh, they have changed the title of each page. They have uh, repositioned the title of each page. Uh, to the next line instead, right? Uh, so as you can see, uh, the title is now uh, you know flush to the left hand side, right? Previously, uh, it is in the center, right? Uh, before they came out with this uh, notch design, I can show you. So something like this, right? But this is still not... Yeah, something like this. Uh, the title is in the center for iPhone 8, right? But, uh, you know, definitely they have to change their design uh, to accommodate to their new hardware, uh, you know, uh, changes. Okay. Uh... This has nothing to do with uh, okay, responsive design. This is just the arrangement, right? Because when we talk about responsive design, we are talking about uh, you know whether our interface can still look good on different uh, uh, on different screen sizes, right? So we are concerned about the the kind of uh, you know. Uh, space sizes, the font sizes that we are using, you know, uh, because if you don't use like a dynamic range of font sizes, if you try to flash it on a large screen device, then, uh, you know, it may appear to, your element may appear to be very, very scattered because there's too much space in between them. So that's why I came up with that formula, right, to fit all the different uh, use cases. Mm. So my question is, should we build our app with all the various screen size from the start? Or start with one screen size first, finish building it before adjusting it for other screen size? Oh, okay, okay. So, so in this case, uh, you have to check uh, what is the adoption rate for different screen size. Okay, I can show you. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so uh this is what I this is a bit outdated now. Uh, this is 2015. Let me see if I can find Mm. Okay, uh, I think most of them falls under the light green line, right? So I definitely, I think you can use this statistic to help you make your decision. But I think the legend actually indicates uh, what kind of dimension people are still using nowadays, right? So last time in the past, we have higher adoption rate for 360 times 640, but it slowly descend, right? Because a mobile phone get bigger, right? Uh, in May 2020. Okay. And then a bigger dimension like 1366 times 768 is slowly on the rise, right? Because screen is getting bigger and bigger. Mm. So uh, actually, you can make use of statistic like this to uh, make use of uh, to come up with a decision, right, on which screen you should design for. Actually, it will be better if they can come up with a pie chart, right? Maybe a bar chart is not a very good uh, uh, illustration. It's quite difficult to see. Uh, this apple. Yeah, I think this is the same chart again. Ah, here. Can pay attention to the consolidated percentage, right? So I think most people are still using four one four times seven three six. This is in Singapore, right? Maybe you need to find out globally what are the statistics. And uh, so maybe you let me change the filtering. This is to Singapore, uh, worldwide, right? last 12 months ah see 360 times 640 is still the winner right okay i hope i have answered your question i think it's very clear mm -hmm. but of course uh you know all these figures are bound to change in the future like, you know when uh those companies come up with more fanciful, uh, you know, hardware design, then maybe who knows, three seven five times six six seven will overtake. Uh, 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 the first spot. 